Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Reimagine V13. Really excited to be talking about all things parachains, interoperability, and covering the Polkadot ecosystem as a whole. I'm your, I'm your host, Roshan Marachkar from the Mouse Belt team. Uh, this is our 13th event, so really excited to be talking about all these things here today. And today our panel will be focused on making Web3 more inclusive, and we're going to also be talking about DeFi and a lot of the mechanisms on Polkadot. Before we get started, I want to give a chance to let all of our guests introduce themselves, um, and then we'll move on to some questions. So we'll start with you, Dan. Welcome to the show. Thanks. It's great to be here. Um, yeah, I guess quick intro. So I lead the growth team at Akala. I've been um, working on the Akala project for about a year and a half now um, and been in the Polkadot ecosystem for three years. I came from Web3 Foundation before this. so. Uh, definitely one of my favorite topics to talk about. So looking forward to this. And we'll move to you, Alex. Hi, folks. Uh, thanks for having me here. Um, I'm Alex. I'm the CEO and the founder with the Equilibrium team. Um, I'm engineering and applied mathematics by training and crypto full-time since 2016. Um, so the team of Equilibrium working together since, uh, I believe, 2017. We're working on different uh, decentralized finance applications, and now we're building on Polkadot, bringing into reality the, our dream of cross-chain interoperability. And so we are building uh, the one-stop uh, DeFi platform, which allows for high leverage in borrowing and trading. And uh, I'm super excited to, about today's talk. Looking we'll forward to that. Yeah, great. Uh, excited to have you both here. And let's move on into the question. Excited to hear from you both. Um, start with you, Dan. And can you kind of start with breaking down, like, what was it about the Polkadot infrastructure or ecosystem that influenced your, your decision uh, to build on it? Maybe just explain to our audience, maybe like kind of what a parachain is. Yeah. Yeah, so um, the Akala team is made up of four co-founders. Three are in New Zealand, one is in um, Shanghai, China. And they met uh, three years ago, three, three and a half years ago, um, when they were originally building a product on, um, on Ethereum for um, synthetic asset trading. But what they realized back then was that Ethereum wasn't going to scale. They were anticipating a lot of these gas fee issues that we saw over the last couple of years. So they started evaluating options um, that they thought were going to be kind of in the next wave of tech. So ETH2 was one, Cosmos was the other, and then Polkadot was the third option. And with Polkadot, you also get this blockchain development framework called Substrate. Um, Substrate, just like Solidity, the programming language on Ethereum were invented by Gavin Wood. So the same person who built Ethereum ended up leaving and building Polkadot because he realized everything that was coming with scalability issues. So he and the team at Web3 Foundation kind of built everything from the ground up. And one of those things was Substrate, which is one of the key reasons why the Akala co-founders chose to build um, in the Polkadot ecosystem. Substrate allows you to build blockchains more easily and also allows you to customize blockchains for specific use cases. So Alex and the Equilibrium team, as well as Akala, we're kind of choosing to focus on DeFi um, and financial use cases. There's other teams focusing on KYC, or KYC and identity, on gaming, um, NFTs. There's just kind of an unlimited number of use cases. So that was one thing. The second uh, piece is security. So Polkadot provides security for everyone, almost like plug and play security. And it also has a unified security set across all of the teams. So no one has to focus on building their own security set of validators. You can kind of just plug into what Polkadot provides, which is a huge value add. And then the third piece is cross-chain or interoperability. So Alex's blockchain, Equilibrium, and Akala are both launched on Polkadot. And through that, we can natively interact with each other. So sending tokens, data, NFTs, whatever, but without the risk of a bridge being hacked, for example. This is native cross-chain, so we're all kind of in the same universe, the same family. And we trust each other, but don't have to actually trust um, a third party or a, or a bridge in between. So those are kind of the three, um, I guess, main reasons why we chose to build on Polkadot. Yeah, no, that's excellent. And I think for audience listening right now, it's a great explanation for these uh, native features that are built in. How about you, Alex? Do you kind of uh, have the same thoughts or do you have some different thoughts on why you chose to build on Polkadot? 
Yeah, so um, I already mentioned that we had experience in building on various blockchains and usually we were considering ourselves as blockchain agnostic team of developers. Um, so back in the days so we were building on Ethereum, uh, then in uh, uh, 2018 we uh, actually switched to EOS and uh, uh, we were building some DeFi things over there. Uh, then we uh, decided to move to more cross-chain interoperable uh, environment because uh, like at the end of the day, uh, sticking to this uh, multi-chain approach from the day one, we decided to build the core infrastructure somewhere uh, on some uh, in some ecosystem where we can uh, roll out all our developments and then interconnect that with uh, different other chains so that we don't need to invest any additional efforts into developments on every single ecosystem that we need to work on. And um, uh, Polkadot was quite quite natural choice, uh, first of all, because of the advantages of the uh, substrate framework, uh, like uh, besides what just Dan mentioned, I will also highlight uh, the off-chain workers functionality, which allows for uh, way more flexibility compared to other heterogeneous chains. And you can actually implement quite sophisticated business logics, uh, which will be uh, eventually validated on chain. And I mean, specifically, like, for example, the results of computation and stuff. Um, and uh, definitely the amount of these computations and uh, the complexity of these computations, something that you cannot afford building on some heterogeneous chains like Ethereum, for example. Um, and uh, another thing like is the diversity of the ecosystem, right? Then mentioned that like there's a bunch of different projects building different functionality, not necessarily DeFi, but maybe some other use cases. It might be IoT or maybe some NFT projects or something like that. Uh, but besides that, we also are anticipating uh, rollouts of different bridges that are also eventually being built as a parachains and interconnected with the whole ecosystem. And in, in terms of that, you're not uh, relying on your just your own developments, but you can be interconnected with other uh, projects who are working on the functionality, which can complement your core uh, kind of business or core applications that you're, you're, you're running on Polkadot. Uh, from this perspective, we are quite big on uh, further deployments of various bridges with various ecosystems, which will be eventually interconnecting Polkadot with um, uh, other chains and uh, other blockchain uh, universes, I would say. And uh, that's something that we are highly anticipating and expecting that it brings certain value uh, to, to our projects and to the ecosystem overall. Yeah, I agree. There's tons of diversity and I've seen other of our guests here at Reimagine V13 talk about how with Polkadot, you can kind of break things in a siloed, uh, in, in a siloed like parachain and not like break the, the main chain, the relay chain, for example, when you're comparing to ETH. Uh, I want to kind of break, if you, guys, if you guys could switch gears a bit and uh, go deeper into talking about maybe the architecture of these parachains kind of on the business side. So uh, my question is, on, on the business side, do you view these parachains right now um, being more into specialization, or like a specific use case? Or is it going to lean more toward commercialization where parachains are collaborating with each other more? I'll go to you, Dan, first. Yeah, I think it's hard. There's going to be up to 100 parachains connected to Polkadot. And I guess going back to your question um, before, like what is a parachain? It's just basically it's a layer one blockchain, just like Ethereum, Solana, Terra. Well, I guess that's a different story, but um, <laughs> these parachains are layer ones uh, connected to Polkadot. And these layer ones can do a couple of different things. So number one, they can specialize in a specific um, use case that's more blockchain native. So like one example would be privacy. So there's chains like Manta and Fala who are focusing on privacy and they will provide that as a service to other dApps in the ecosystem as well as other parachains. Then there's also blockchains that are more um, meant to be kind of like application platforms. So I would put Akala in this category. There's Moonbeam and Astar and, and plenty of others that are building up these dApp ecosystems. Um, so the way we look at it is we basically have like, we have Polkadot providing the security. We call Polkadot a layer zero because it's below all these layer ones. And then you have the layer one parachains that's, that you can have built in kind of customized um, almost like building blocks for a specific thing. So in Akala's case, we have a stable coin built into our chain. We have a DEX that helps run liquidations for that stable coin and a liquid staking product. 
But on top of that, we have this EVM environment where people can come and build applications. Um, what we're doing also as well, as far as uh, the business side is we're working with fintech companies to kind of plug in to those dApps that are going to be building on Akala. So money markets that are offering like lending and borrowing or DEXs that are offering um, LP positions for people to earn yield from providing liquidity to, to the decentralized exchange. These are examples of, of liquidity and yield that um, fintech companies from what the Web2 world can plug into and bring yield from DeFi to their customers um, without having to kind of mess with all of the complexity, public and private keys, um, and just UX issues in general that we still kind of face in the crypto and, and DeFi space. Um, and yeah, Alex, I don't know if you have any other, other comments too. No, maybe just in general, I would say that uh, we at Equilibrium are mostly focusing on our specialization. So we're not expecting uh, that much like other projects running on top of our parachain chain at the end of the day. So we are kind of building um, the practical use cases that will eventually fit into the ecosystem and uh, bring value to our partners. Um, like specifically, we uh, will be running the money markets, which will be integrated uh, through the XM connections with uh, other parachains. And uh, we eventually will open up um, the liquidity pools for native tokens of these projects. And uh, that definitely will be one of use cases for them and for their token holders. Um, at the same time, uh, we also will be offering some other trading functionality, uh, like specifically for uh, so-called liquid dot wrappers, which is quite common uh, uh, sort of use case for those who are participating in uh, crowd loans. We'll be offering some uh, very customized, tailored specifically for trading this, uh, mm, uh, this type of assets like automated market maker. And uh, also we'll be adding like Liquid dot wrappers from uh, from uh, Ecala Parallel and uh, other other projects, and hopefully also bring certain value in these funds. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, like in general, I think the this collaborative spirit is quite common for the Polkadot ecosystem right now because uh, like all the projects realizing that by complementing each other and bringing certain value to each other, it's uh, actually eventually like all the ecosystem participants will benefit benefit from that. Yeah, for sure. And on the topic of stable coins, you know, everyone's been talking about it, of course, for the past couple of months. And I know you, Dan, are kind of focused on building a multi, you know, you know, multi-chain stable, decentralized stable coin. Can you talk about some of the benefits of having a stable coin maybe that we can trust across all the networks versus some of the more centralized stable coins that are still prominent in the ecosystem today? Yeah, this has definitely been a huge topic over the last few weeks. So I guess first, it's helpful to start with the basics of the different types of stable coins, because I think before this whole debacle, everyone kind of assumed that all stable coins were equal. They're all just one dollar. And that's really that all that matters. But now everyone's starting to look under the hood as far as how these stable coins actually work. So there's really three main categories. Number one is fiat backed. So that's like a, a real dollar in an in a actual bank account. $1 for every $1 in USDC or USDT, for example, that's issued into the market. So it's backed by fiat. The second one is um, over collateralized uh, stable coins. So this is similar to DAI on Ethereum and then AUSD on Polkadot. And these are stable coins that for every $1 stable coin that's issued, you need at least two times as much collateral backing that stable coin. Um, so for example, if you have $100 worth of DOT, you can use that as collateral and you can mint or issue um, yourself $50 worth of AUSD. So that over, that's why it's called over collateralization. In the real world, this wouldn't really be um, realistic. Like you would never give your bank $100,000 to take out a $50,000 loan for, for a car, for example. But this is how we, um, in, in crypto, this is how you help uh, hedge against fluctuation in price of that underlying collateral. So if dot price did go down 50%, there are still mechanisms in place to make sure that number one, you're over collateralized. So that helps to provide buffer. And then also the way that the way that the stable coin actually works is there's um, what's called liquidations, which are basically like selling off part of your collateral to, to get the stable coin back up to kind of a healthy ratio. So AUSD, the easiest way to think about it is, is like a multi-chain version of DAI. 
DAIs had a lot of success on Ethereum, but when it um, when it bridges out like through um, let's bridges to let's say Solana or to Avalanche, there's still that risk um, of using that bridge that we've seen in the past has had some issues. The thing, the really exciting thing about um, Polkadot and, and AUSD specifically as a, as a Polkadot native stablecoin built with Substrate is that AUSD can transfer from Akala or from Karura on the Kusama side to any parachain natively without the risk of um, bridging. So it's native transfer without trust, um, just provided by the, the Polkadot tech stack. So um, real quick, the third category is algorithmic stablecoins. So these are stablecoins that um, largely have been basically experiments up until now. Um, they're not backed by anything. They're not backed by fiat dollars. They're not backed by collateral. They were, they are most, for the most part, purely relying on um, typically like a minting and burning mechanism to basically arbitrage or, or buy and sell if the stablecoin falls above or below a dollar. Um, that works well in a bull market as we saw, but it does not work well when the market goes down. Um, so that's kind of what happened with algorithmic stable coins as of, as of late um, and has just brought a renewed kind of confidence in the decision that we made around um, the, the mechanism of AUSD and choosing an over collateralized stable coin. Um, last, I know that I've been talking for a while, last quick thing on centralized versus decentralized is we have made it a point to keep AUSD decentralized, meaning that it's backed by decentralized assets. So crypto native things like DOT, KSM, liquid DOT, liquid KSM. Um, the, the opposite is centralized stablecoins. So USDC and USDC or, and USDT, they will always, for, at least for the, for the foreseeable future, have their own customer set, like big institutions, people who like to trust institutions and third parties, that's, that's great for them. There's also a lot of people who hold kind of the ethos of crypto close to their close to their heart, and they want to be using things that are truly decentralized and don't have the risk of being um, being censored or being intermediated with because the because of the risk of a bank or an institution or some auditing firm being able to actually affect um, USDC or, or USDCT and these centralized stable coins. So. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the where we are in stable coins. Yeah, no, I love that explanation. Thank you for that. Because I think for our audience, even crypto people in general, you're you're totally right. Like everyone thought they're all a stable coin is a stable coin, but that's not exactly the case. Um, I'll go to you, Alex. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, what are the benefits of maybe having a decentralized multi-chain stable coin on uh, when we're looking into the future for things like creating synthetic assets, um, because I think with Terra's case and algorithmic stable coins that also build uh, synthetic assets, it, we could see that it didn't really work uh, in that sense. Um, uh, overall, I think that building uh, decentralized synthetic assets is uh, the great concept of crypto because uh, it definitely helps to um, solve the issue of volatility. It also solves the problem of uh, immediate access to capital if it comes to leveraging your volatile asset portfolio. And um, uh, we, we had experience in building centralized stable coins as well. Uh, we've been building centralized stable coin, coin on the US ecosystem back in the days. We currently have decentralized stable coin on Equilibrium, which is called EQD. However, we are not planning for expanding that stable coin like anyhow um, outside our own ecosystem currently it's used primarily for uh, our decentralized exchange as a mean of quotation and uh, it's uh, kind of um, uh, working in a similar way how uh, per se AUSD works or DAI works so it's backed by the portfolio of crypto collateral uh, but uh, again, it's used primarily within our ecosystem and simplifies user experience when it comes to leverage, to trading, and so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, uh, genuinely speaking, like there might be different uh, uh, different synthetic asset based on this uh, concept. So not necessarily big back to uh, US dollar, but they also can track some other uh, assets. Uh, for example, like I don't know whether you're familiar with the concept of rice stablecoin which is uh, efficiently not tracking any kind of fiat money, uh, but uh, it's uh, kind of stable in, in its value and based on, on the 
overall kind of uh, um, uh, value of uh, baskets of different assets. So it's pretty interesting concept. So if you're not familiar with that, really advise you to familiarize yourself. Um, and um, yeah, so there, there are some, some other uh, implications, like for example, you can build like synthetic, um, synthetic um, uh, stocks uh, based on this concept if, if it's needed, which will be tracking like some uh, uh, whatever stocks or some, uh, so, so some other securities. Um, so, I mean, uh, definitely this, this concept is uh, very uh, popular and uh, has a lot, of, uh, a lot of implications in the ecosystem. Yeah, and I kind of want to go deeper into this, like kind of get into talking about how does all this technology kind of make Web3 more inclusive? So maybe Alex, can you talk, in, in, Alex, in your, in your view, do you think that these advancements in, in polka dots uh, and with the parachain, like, you know, technologies like XCM that's um, enabling more communication and interoperability, is this going to benefit um, new retail, like investors, users first, or Will it be um, the institutions? Because I know you're building a lot of products related to what institutions might use. Um, so I think uh, XM definitely helps the Polkadot ecosystem to interact uh, with uh, within itself, right? To projects to interact with each other and move assets without any risk to um, uh, any kind of you know bridges and uh, all this kind of stuff. Uh, so this is uh, really helpful for building uh, like DeFi products specifically because you can expect uh, uh, like safe connections with almost all major projects within the ecosystem, so so-called internal internal composability of the network. And uh, obviously, if it comes to some practical use cases uh, which uh, are uh, designed to help like token holders to make. Uh, their assets work harder on different other protocols that definitely helps like institutions, for example, to transfer their tokens or holdings from one chain uh, on Polkadot to another parachain and uh, to make use of that in uh, some different product line. Uh, again, on our side, at Equilibrium, we're offering quite a bunch of functionality which uh, definitely serves the needs of uh, institutional um, uh, sort of holders of assets as well. Uh, specifically like liquidity providers who might be keen on providing liquidity into our liquidity pools of the money markets or liquidity pools of our decentralized exchange. Um, and uh, we are offering quite, you know, distance yields on, on, on these assets. Uh, simultaneously, they can be guaranteed that these assets will not disappear uh, uh, due to different, you know, bridges and bridges or something. So, yeah. Yeah, no, thanks for that explanation. I think both sides of it are cool. We need um, all the large institutions and then a lot of the products you guys are building, like everyday people have the power to use those too. And then in the real world, they, they just don't, whether it's borrowing money or, or getting leverage. I think it's super cool. Um, and even what Dan was saying about security, it's kind of interesting um, building on Polkadot. You don't have to really worry about all these things individually. Um, I'll go to you next, Dan, and kind of getting more into talking about um, adoption, maybe what are some of the barriers or applications that you guys might uh, see or suggest people maybe use. So my question is, what are what do you think is still some of the barriers um, for retail investors? And are there any specific like applications people can use today to actually see the value? Yeah, <clears throat> in the... In the Polkadot ecosystem, I think that every, most people would agree that UX, our user experience, is the biggest kind of um, challenge for retail users. Um, but you also have to realize that Polkadot is completely different than anything people are used to. So like everyone who's used on-chain dApps, so most people have used MetaMask and interacted with Ethereum before it was impossible to use due to gas fees, but now like Poly, Polygon and Avalanche and others, um, but these are single chains. So it, it, it makes sense that it would be easier to build as a, as a developer. So Polkadot up until now, up until the, 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 week, the launch of XCM or cross consensus messaging, just like three or four weeks ago, Polkadot really wasn't doing much besides just allowing people to stake their dot. So people were going in uh, early users and trying to stake dot directly on Polkadot with this tool called Polkadot.js. And it like scared a lot of people off. But the, the thing to remember is that that is not the ultimate 
vision of polka dot that was very early polka dot what polka dots meant to be is to be almost like the underground subways and piping system of a city you don't really look at it you don't notice it you just use it and benefit from it polka dots the same way it's an infrastructure that you shouldn't even see and most users the, the millions of users who are going to use polka dot in the next few years are going to be using applications that are just happen to be secured by polka dot but there you won't be able to really tell that you're using polka dot so this is the thing we we, we need more dApps. so this is all beginning to launch now so more applications to launch and then we also need better um wallets and 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 these web browser wallets to interact with these applications. So Talisman is a team um, out of Australia who's doing a great job at this. And then um, Subwallet is a team out of Vietnam who's also doing a great job at improving the user experience with interacting with, with Polkadot. Um, so that's definitely great progress to see um, teams kind of stepping up and, and building um, these wallets. And then I guess over the longer term, um, what I'm excited for is to get um, the benefits of of Polkadot as well as DeFi and bring that to people outside of crypto who may not even really realize that they're interacting with and benefiting from crypto. So this is what I kind of hinted at before with fintechs. Um, Current.com is a fintech in New York that we've been working with for a while. And um, in the very near future, we're going to start rolling out products to their customers that are using their um, checking and, and savings account app but we'll be able to interact with crypto in a way of like, for example, holding um, LDOT and, and earning staking returns just by holding an asset or using AUSD to earn yield um, by current actually using a Kala on the back end, but bringing that yield to their users in the, in the place that they're used to using for their, for their finances. So that's what gets me excited is starting to bring crypto to millions of people without the UX problems um, that we have in crypto today. Yeah, well said. And I'll turn it to you, Alex, if you want to speak a little bit about, are there any specific applications that you suggest maybe regular everyday people kind of uh, start with? Um, so yeah, but first of all, let me um, answer the first part, part of the question related to the user experience and stuff, because I also have some uh, something to say here. It's like, uh, firstly, like my, my two cents here, that's, um, I think in terms of specifically the Polkadot adoption, uh, we need to look more into integration of uh, Polkadot's uh, sort of experience into existing infrastructure in crypto, uh, like specifically if uh, Polkadot will manage to integrate um, their sort of functionality into MetaMask or some other walls being uh, widely adopted, that will be definitely very helpful uh, so that uh, users who used to be working with Ethereum and some other chains could would not be forced to install any other software to interact with Polkadot that definitely will be uh, game changer for the overall Polkadot adoption. And um, uh, another thing here, like again, Polkadot has a lot of complexity on the backgrounds. Uh, then mentioned like all these kind of issues with that. And uh, also I totally agree that the Polkadot can be considered as a sort of, you know, pipes and uh, some engineering system on the background. Uh, and uh, obviously there is a lot of complexity with the accounts that accounts are different on the, the different chains. Like you need to switch between accounts, which is uh, working with uh, relay chain to the, uh, the same represent the, the representation of the same accounts working with uh, parachains, which is kind of, you know, difficult to understand for the regular users. So that's something that we need to actually put under, under the hood that user will not be familiarized themselves with these kind of things. Um, so in terms of the dApps that uh, um, uh, I might suggest using right away, um, like I'm super excited about the developments uh, of uh, like our colleagues uh, uh, from uh, DeFi sort of field, like obviously uh, colleagues from Akala doing a great job, Parallel is doing a great job. Uh, but also, I think that it's quite interesting to see how perform uh, such projects as, uh, for example, Nodal, who are working on the IoT things, and uh, that might be also interesting uh, use case for the substrate technology. Um, um, there is there are some projects working on NFTs uh, in in the space that also might be 
uh, interesting, like, uh, for example, RMRK or uh, Unique. So you also can uh, watch, uh, watch these projects, their progress. Um, yeah, so in terms of like the overall adoption, again, I totally agree with Dan that, uh, you know, applications that are actually interact with the users the way that user doesn't realize that it's built on blockchain is super exciting. Uh, like um, definitely the success of Stepen publication, for example, is uh, really interesting. And uh, I think they they did like they have they have taken a few steps uh, towards this um, uh, sort of direction of uh, hiding from the end user the uh, blockchain parts of part of the things. So yeah, and uh, I think like overall social fi elements for um, for DApps will definitely be sort of improved and uh, adopted widely and that will definitely lead to more wider adoption overall yeah for sure i i agree with both of you the ux ui is something that's con constantly improving and i think that's an interesting perspective that maybe that more new crypto users might use something like Polkadot and not really think about the, the blockchain element underneath I think one interesting thing, just talking about use cases, we've seen, you know, Polkadot be prominent at, recently at Davos. So there's been a lot of talks among uh, governments. So I want to get your guys' perspective on, you know, do you think there's anything that stands out with the Polkadot architecture or ecosystem? It could be community as well that might um, be more likely for governments to use it. Uh, not And, and uh, to also include the, the ESG component uh, about how, it's so green and eco-friendly. I think the most eco-friendly proof of stake uh, blockchain. Uh, we'll start with you, Dan, if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I think maybe government adoption of, of Polkadot is in the same category almost as like regulatory treatment of Polkadot. So Polkadot is one of the most decentralized um, blockchains in terms of investors. So if you look at uh, I won't name other layer ones, but if you look at some other layer ones, it's extremely concentrated. There's like two or three VCs that own most of the tokens and that is inherently centralized. And then also if you look under the hood, how the actual node operators are, work, um, Polkadot has a huge set of validators. I think now it's up to maybe three or 400 on Polkadot and over a thousand on Kusama. That just shows that the network itself is very decentralized. And this is exactly what governments look at and regulators look at when they're evaluating these platforms. Um, I don't, I don't have, I don't know a whole lot about like the current state of um, like actual applications that governments are looking to build on Polkadot, but I, I think just the, the overall decentralization and just kind of like web three vision of Polkadot from the beginning um, lends itself well to, to adoption in, in that, I guess, uh, in the, in the government segment. And Alex, if you want to give sort of your uh, breakdown and thoughts on, do you think it, there's anything specific for governments to be adopting the Polkadot technology? Um, yeah, so basically the decentralization of Polkadot and how uh, Paris and Web3 uh, approach uh, these kind of issues uh, was one of the main reasons why we, we've chosen Polkadot for developments, because we think that it's one of the most decentralized ecosystems overall, uh, like vibrant community and uh, it's like almost total decentralization on chain. Um, so in terms of like the governance model on Polka, in Polkadot itself, it's uh, pretty much thought out and uh, it might be a good example for real kind of high quality governance processes that can be applied for various you know, organizations and stuff. Uh, like all these technical committees and then uh, different council proposals and stuff, which uh, actually helps to run this kind of network. So definitely, uh, Polkadot can be adopted by uh, you know some governmental structures to build something on top of that, because uh, again, it's totally decentralized and uh, pretty reliant on security perspective. Um, again, I, I, I'm also not aware of any kind of uh, plans of particular governments to deploy something particular, but yeah, so that's my perspective on that. Yeah, thanks for your thoughts. And I think it's kind of interesting how the governance, the voting, the, the security elements all happen inside the relay chain and then all the parachains are really focused on building great applications. Uh, to kind of end things off, 
I uh, just want to get your parting advice, uh, both of you, for new builders, uh, new developers, maybe who are uh, just starting off building in the Polkadot ecosystem. I'll go to you first, Dan. Yeah, I mean, great decision if you're building in the Polkadot ecosystem. Uh, we definitely don't chase hype. This is this is going to be the next, um, I guess, in my opinion, over the over the next you know five ten years. This is a long term platform. Clearly, it's been it's been taking a while. It took six years to, to get Polkadot fully launched, but um, there's a lot of great teams building parachains. Um, so definitely feel free to join some of these kind of community groups, ask questions. Everyone's willing to help if you're building a parachain. And then if you're building a DAP, there's just uh, the sky's the limit with the, with the number of use cases that you're going to be able to do um, cross chain, as well as the fact that. If you're building a DAP on any parachain, one thing we didn't mention is that all these parachains can be upgraded without forking. So building on any parachain is essentially building on a, on a blockchain that's future-proof because it can constantly be upgraded like an app on your phone um, versus others like Ethereum that of course require these um, painstaking forks. So yeah, I guess for new, new builders, just welcome and uh, looking forward to working with you. Yeah, great advice. And lastly, I'll move to you, Alex. Um, yeah, definitely it's a great decision to start building on uh, Polkadot because it's the right time to start things off right away because uh, the Polkadot ecosystem is just taking off. It's the very beginning of uh, its development. Uh, be prepared for um, a very different uh, developer experience compared to other chains because, uh, uh, first of all, the uh, sort of flexibility that you will uh, run into when you'll be building on uh, the substrate framework uh, is really incredible. So you've never been that flexible in your developments before if it comes to building like in some isolated environments uh, like EVM or something like that. It's totally different. Um, you will be, will be basically coding the runtime of your own blockchain at the end of the day, which gives you certain advantages and simultaneously applies certain um, uh, sort of requirements in terms of your qualification, uh, qualification of your team. Um, so it's quite challenging on one, on one hand. On another hand, uh, it definitely helps to build really uh, highly customized and, uh, yeah, you know, uh, crafted for particular use cases applications. Well said, both of you. And I think the challenges is what breeds innovation. I had a great time chatting with you both and I think our audience learned a lot. Um, for our audience, stick around. We still have more interviews here at Reimagine V13. And thank you. Enjoy the rest of the show.